Sarah and Marion are. And then, so Let I know them introduce I'm themselves. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm growing tomatoes as part of the project. So I'm Great. Very excited about that. I have, uh, I bought, I got 20 and I have 10 of them either in Great. the ground or in containers. And I just want to learn more and, and cool. eat really yummy tomatoes. What you're doing is important work. So thank you for uh, jumping in. And uh, Justin just joined us too. So we have another, another person. So Sarah. Um, I'm Sarah. I am Melissa's sidekick at Working Food. And uh, so I'm excited to finally meet you. I've read your book probably a dozen times. I borrow from Melissa every year. <laughs> um, so I'm excited to, to, to learn from you directly. Thank you. Thank you for the kind words. It's uh, appreciated. And do you want, do you know who Justin, Justin is? I don't. Do you wanna... Justin. Welcome, Justin. Do you want to just quick introduce yourself? We're a small group here today. I feel like I'm not the one that needs the introduction. I'm just the uh, I'm just the supportive boyfriend here. But <laughs> I, I think the uh, the gal of the hour is Miss Emily, and oh, hey. she has a, an affinity and an affection for tomatoes. That's all. That's all I know. So that's awesome. Here we are. Affinity is a strong word. I'm just interested in in reading and, and yeah. I'm interested in, in getting greater knowledge and and mm. how I can be more self sustaining. And I love, I feel like I'm on the road. This is great. Look at the, yeah. the background. <laughs> this is like so cool. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I mean, uh, I mean we'll I'm pretty easily amused. So don't, don't let me know. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for joining. Uh, like we're, you're on the we're, road, but we're I'm glad you're here. We're going to log off with audio and video, but we're here. We're listening. Okay. We're taking okay. notes. All cool. right. Well, jump in if you got something to say. All right. Want to roll? Let's do it. All right, let me share my screen. Uh, I, I, I'm Craig Lahoulier, as you probably know, um, um, in Hendersonville, North Carolina, and just always really happy to share um, the work that I do um, because it's fun. I'm a, I'm a retired chemist. I worked a miserable 25 years in pharma, but now I get to do all this cool stuff. So let's... Uh, Move along. So we call I call the project, and when I finally write the book on this, I'm going to call it crowd breeding because it's kind of a cool new word, and that's what we did. So we're going to really focus on the Evie part of this project. Uh, a lot of it through being reminded by Melissa where we should um, really take the discussion. But I like to always start a talk to show people what's going on in my backyard. And about two and a half years ago, we moved from hot, crowded, expensive Raleigh to lovely rural Hendersonville where the red buds and the lilacs are in bloom and my dog Coda is overseeing the straw bales out there. Uh, this is my future garden. Um, where Coda is on that end of it are gonna be cucumbers, summer squash and uh, beans, bush beans. And then in the straw bales will go indeterminate tomatoes and peppers and eggplant. And in front of every straw bale will be a grow bag with a dwarf tomato. So. Uh, instead of 109 tomatoes, which last year was so wildly successful, we were picking 50 pounds of tomatoes a day for a month and a half, and it was scaring the crap out of us. We're going to keep it a little bit calmer this year. I will make you envious. We, we had one day at 90 last year. Every day last year is between 82 and 85. The nights were in the 50s and 60s. So my fruit set was just insane. And it was, a, it was a great year to have the garden to do the tomato course with Joe Lample, but we were giving so many tomatoes away and canning them, it was just insane. And whereas typically at this time of the year, I'd be getting ready to sell tomato seedlings and I'd have hundreds and hundreds of these trays, this year I'm gardening for me. So this is really um, the R&D stuff that I'm running. This is tomatoes, peppers, eggplant, some basil, some snapdragons, and money plant and all kinds of things. But this is also the stage that we're at because we're still getting surprise nighttime frosts. And we're a week away before things can go outside. That's a really nice salvia that I found at a local garden center that I can't put in the ground yet because it's tender. So why did we do this project anyway? And this is us selling tomato plants at the farmer's market back in the early 2000s. The most frequently asked question I got at the time was, what if you got great, but I don't have to climb a ladder to pick it? 
it tastes good and I can grow it in a container in my driveway or patio. And there were very few answers to that question at the time. So my friend Petrina and I set apart to create a project. And the project was stimulated from reading this old sea catalog that I had where they talked about how to create large, delicious tomatoes on a short growing plant. And they essentially said what we did was we crossed Ponderosa, which is a one pound pink, tall growing variety with Dwarf Champion, which had nice short growth habit, but the tomatoes were only three ounces and they must have grown it, grown the hybrid, selected away and got this one pound tomato on a three foot tall plant. All we did then, they didn't have all of these wild colored heirlooms to choose from. So they, the project was very limited what they could create, but it wasn't limited for us. I, I think I have about four or 5,000 tomato varieties in my collection and Petrina and I just went nuts. We made crosses and um, I have to move the, the pictures of us away from the side. Sorry, I'm gonna go back. So we started this project in 2005 through discussions on garden web. It's 17 years later, it's funny when I read, we formally ended the project in 2018. We just ended it on a, on a ginormous scale and it's still ticking along with little pockets of activity like yours and what I'm doing and just a few other really interested people. I'm now playing with the really crazy stuff like variegated foliage and anthocyanin and yellow leaves and just making it really fun. But we've had now over a thousand volunteers from 50 states and 25 countries. This has been a, um, it hasn't been a documentation nightmare, but it certainly has challenged me because there's a lot of emails, a lot of spreadsheets, a lot of data, but we've put 145 varieties in seed catalogs and Victory Seeds in particular carries all 145, but you've got fruition and heritage and restoration and adaptive and Southern exposure. Other seed companies have taken an interest. And it's funny because when we started out, I talked to Rob Johnson and don't forget, we, we started releasing tomatoes in about 2010. And I asked Johnny's if they'd be interested. And he says, well, we don't think there's much of a market in container gardening. Well, Rob is a great guy, but he is not an Oracle. I knew there would be an interest in uh, container gardening. Mike Dunton at Victory knew just because of the, inf the questions they were getting as a seed company. And we've used this really unique approach of not doing the burpee method of here's a great new tomato, we're gonna to put it on the cover and make it sexy. We're just gonna give the varieties to seed companies and have them release them with the information and then, and then see how word of mouth works. And uh, I Googled one of our first releases, Tasmanian Chocolate 2010, there are now 25 plus seed companies the world over offering it. So. And it's also open source. We, we tell people the crosses we're doing. None of us in the project get money from this. So we've used this open source, altruistic, unique way of harnessing the activities and resources and talents of amateurs and home gardeners and have created something really cool. So when I talk to um, ASI, the open source seed initiative to marinate, I think what they're particularly interested in is the process we used in terms of taking that process and applying it to other crops and other projects. So this is Petrina from Australia on the right. She actually flew over to attend one of our tomato paloozas in 2008. All of the tomatoes on that table were dwarfs and we had 200 people there to taste them. And when we looked at the smiles in their faces, we knew that we were moving things in the right direction. So how do we do this anyway? It all starts with a cross and we pick an existing dwarf, and I'll talk about what dwarfs are in a moment, and we use those as the female. And I'll tell you why we do that in a moment, but we use the pollen from the male, and the male is the indeterminate uh, variety. And it uses uh, a vibrating device that helps us collect the pollen in the spoon and a pair of tweezers that helps us to pull the anther cone off the female flower. You pick a dry morning, and I know in Florida that may not be so easy in terms of the humidity, but maybe early in the morning, once the dew is dried off, and you just look for a wide open flower and you put it, that black spoon is nice because you can see the pollen. And if you buzz the flower and it's ready to release this pollen, there's enough pollen in that spoon to fertilize probably 500 flowers. So 
the pollen grains are really tiny. And then what you do is you go to your female, the receptor variety, and you very carefully find a flower that's not quite fully open yet. Because what happens with tomatoes is they're perfect flowers. They have both male and female. And if all goes well, as the flower opens, the anthers brush against the pistil and the pollen is transformed and that flower pollinates. So even if the bees visit that flower, it's very likely that the deed has already been done. But if the bees timing is just right, they can actually apply pollen from a different variety and create a hybrid that you didn't expect. So by using not yet fully open flowers, you'll know the bees haven't visited them yet. You'll know that the anthers haven't been brushed against the pistil yet. And you just have to give it a tug and it pops off. And you have to be really careful to leave that central, um, the style present because you want to apply the pollen at that, the tip of that little thing sticking out is very sticky. And if you just brush that, and this isn't quite great focus, but it gets the job done. You just dip um, that flower into the pollen and you want to repeat this two or three times over the coming days because that flower wasn't quite fully opened yet you're not quite sure whether the pistol was ready to accept the pollen. So if you do this two, three, four days in a row, you will have a better chance of success. And I always mark this with a twisty tie as well as use scissors to snip the sepals off. So I use several methods to mark so I know I can find that flower again. So here you'll see the little twisty tie, you'll see the sepals have been snipped, but a tomato is formed. And if that ovary starts enlarging, you have a great chance that that, po that that pollination work. And I mark it with a Sharpie with an X. So I know that that is now an F1 hybrid between the parent male where the pollen came from and the dwarf female. And the female, the tomato is on the female. Now we'll get into the genetics in a moment, but this is Petrina and this is what an R&D a lot of you are probably going to have, well, this is Australia and it's one of Petrina's, it's Petrina's beautiful garden, but she's probably got a hundred different dwarf tomatoes growing out there, looking at tomatoes in all various stages of generations. Um, and this is what my driveway in Raleigh, and Melissa knows us well because she visited me, but this is what R&D looked like in my driveway in Raleigh, where I have all of my plants. And, and this is deceptive because this looks so neat and tidy and they're all lined up like little soldiers, but the plants get big, they get heavy, they start tipping, and then it becomes a real challenge of keeping everything upright. Whereas if you were growing these in the ground and you could hammer a stake into the ground next to those grow bags or in a big garden, um, you could keep these all upright. Here's another view. Um, this came from my book. Um, this is the weird hand water in the funny looking shorts, but I love to hand water my garden because that way I got to look at every plant every day and could see what was setting fruit and where the diseases were starting. So I could pluck off the foliage and where the foliage was disappearing so I could find the tomato hornworm. Now, this is what my R&D area looks like here. So my, my driveway instead of concrete is now gravel and I have my plants and grow bags up on pallets. This is from last year, and you can see the indeterminate varieties in the straw bales growing in the background. So there's always, you can always find a place to play. Now let's get a little bit more specific about Evie and the project at hand in dwarf. So the dwarfing gene creates a thick center stem. It creates foliage that is wrinkly and dark bluish green. And in this picture, you can see dwarf regular leaf is on the top left. And, and indeterminate regular leaf is on the bottom left. So the dwarfing crinkles up the foliage, makes it thicker looking. You, you don't have potato leaf in your Evie cross, but we have done a lot with potato leaf in our dwarf project. And on the right is normal looking potato leaf like brandywine in the bottom and a dwarf like dwarf sweet sue with that crinkled up rugose foliage on the upper right. Uh, indeterminates, grow forever. If you know Everglades, you know indeterminate. If you know Cherokee purple or sun gold, you know indeterminate. They sucker everywhere. You may need a strategy for topping them or pruning them a little bit to remove some of the suckers or staking and tying. 
but they will grow forever. And since you don't have frost down there, they'll grow until the disease takes them or until you've had enough of them. Determinant is upper right. And that is a gene that really didn't pop up until the 1920s, actually in a Florida variety called Cooper Special. Uh, the person was growing, I think, a variety called June Pink, which is indeterminate. And he noticed one plant got to about three feet tall and it flowered everywhere and it produced really heavily. And then he picked his crop and it was pretty much done. So that self-topping characteristic of determinant was used in a lot of tomato breeding. And a lot of the field tomatoes grown in Florida are actually determinants and they're all descendant from the variety Cooper Special. Other determinants would be Taxi or Sophie's Choice or the Roma varieties. They look just like normal indeterminates in terms of foliage and they grow just like them until they hit about three or four feet tall and then they stop growing upward, they branch out, they flower everywhere, they produce their crop in about two weeks and then they're done. They don't really taste all that good because they're producing so many tomatoes, you don't have enough foliage for all of the photosynthesis needed to develop the intense flavors. Dwarfs in the lower right take the best of both. They take the compact growth of determinants. They take the consistent, gradual fruiting throughout the season of the indeterminants. And how I think of them is they grow at half the rate vertically. So if you have a Cherokee purple in your garden at a point in the season that's eight feet tall, your heavy dwarf selection will be about four feet tall. The reason it's hard to put specific heights on these is it depends on how you feed them, how many hours of sun they get, um, what the weather is like that year. So a lot of gardeners want all of the specificity, how many days to maturity, how tall does it get? But with gardening, there is no specificity. Everything depends. And that frustrates people. Um, I've, learned to, I've learned to own it and love it and live with it. Um, it's things you learn. So Melissa tells me that in EVI, you may have a subtype that's neither indeterminate nor dwarf, but maybe a form of a determinant with normal foliage. And it could be that since Everglades is just, just such a monstrous plant with such a skinny stem, it could just be a form of dwarf that is more closely related to the EVI genes where um, the smaller, the more compact types will take on more of the Tanunda red gene. So Melissa, anything you wanna mention about that? I mean, it, it, it just struck me now that you may be actually seeing just different types of dwarfs that are exhibiting the, the genetics of the parents a little bit. Yeah, um, and Sarah can jump in here too, but what we noticed last year is that even the ones that seem more indeterminate and sprawling right. around, they look very dwarfy. Like they had yeah. the nice thick crinkly leaves and were really compact yep. and didn't need trellising at all, but they were yeah. not like a compact right. plant that you'd right. stick in a pot. And it was really curious. And actually Sarah yeah. was the one that pointed it out earlier. Cause I was like, we have a dwarf and a non-dwarf. And she's like, no, they were both dwarfs. And I'm like, oh my gosh, you're right. But like one was very yep. different and we've had to recommend it differently yeah. to people who have limited space of like, well, this yeah. one's short and you probably won't have to trellis it, but it's definitely, right. we're expecting it anyways to sprawl yep. around a little bit more like it's Everglades um, yeah. father. Yeah. No. So that's what father, I think you've yeah. got is, is the super compact one is more like mom and the more sprawly one is more like dad because Everglades is dad in mm -hmm. these cases, which is really cool. And I have found, so Everglades is a pink, tiny tomato. Mexico midget is a tiny red tomato, but any of the crosses we've made with Mexico midget show the same types of characteristics where we've got some dwarfs, dwarfs that are quite compact and some that are more sprawling. So I think we're seeing in a way the same thing that you're seeing, which is fascinating. Now, mm -hmm. another thing to say about here, let's talk about the goals. One of the reasons I'm excited, so why did we do this cross anyway? And I think I'm gonna show the cross here in a second. So let me wait, I'm gonna to get to that. This is what classic dwarfs look like in my driveway. So these are ones that didn't use an Everglade or a Mexico midget type parent. And they're very compact and they're very pretty and they've got that dark blue green leaf. So let's start here a little bit more. Indeterminant is always dominant to dwarf. So one of the reasons we use the dwarf as a female 
is that you know you do that pollen and you see that tomato form, you save seeds from it. In that same season, you can grow some out. And if the plants are indeterminate, you know the cross worked because you're saving a tomato from a dwarf plant, but the seeds are giving an indeterminate variety. So that is your quick, by using a dwarf as the female every time, you will get an almost immediate indication on a successful cross by just growing out some of those first seeds. Regular leaf is always um, dominant to potato. That's not of a concern to you. This one is interesting to Evie. Yellow skin color is dominant. So when I crossed Everglades, which is pink, clear skin, with Tanunda red, which is dwarf, yellow skin, the hybrid was red. It shows the determinant characteristic of the yellow skin color over the red flesh, which is a red tomato. You should see a distribution of scarlet or red tomatoes and pink clear skin tomatoes um, amongst those things that you grow out. Um, this is important. Fruit size is small. So Evie, which is tiny, crossed with an eight to 10 ounce dwarf, gave a one ounce hybrid because that small fruit size is so dominant. So it could very well be that you're not going to see very much beyond the size of cherry tomatoes when you do your grow outs, although you, do, you may see a few three ounce, four ounce golf ball up to maybe six ounce tomatoes if you're lucky. It's gonna be like finding a needle in a haystack. Fruit shape, round is dominant and we don't need to know about the last one. We talked a bit about this, why dwarf is used as a female. So I sent Melissa lots of the seeds I saved from the hybrid. And in growing that out, three quarters of those seedlings will be indeterminate and one quarter will be dwarf. That's just Punnett square stuff, it's three to one. Um, the dwarf seedlings are very distinctive and I'm going to show them in a bit. And it takes six to 10 generations to actually stabilize a new variety out of this. Um, now, here's something else distinct about the Evie project. In our dwarf tomato project, the goal is dwarf. So all of our volunteers, if they're playing with the F2 and they get that three to one ratio of indeterminate dwarf, they just throw all of the indeterminates away. We know that we're throwing away some really interesting, great stuff, but that's not the focus. For you, I think the main goal of EVI should be taking advantage of the disease resistant and disease tolerant genes that are in Everglades to create varieties, be they dwarf or indeterminate or red or pink or cherry tomatoes or larger that will be able to withstand your conditions in Florida, the diseases that hit your plants. So a successful outcome of this project will be that you have a set of new tomato varieties that look like they're gonna succeed for people. Whereas previously it would be really tough to find that success because of the diseases you have because we've incorporated some of the diseases of Evie. So this is an F2 generation. And you'll see in the back, you've got those tall skinny indeterminants and you can really see it in the right front cell where the dwarfs have, even at this stage, they have a thicker stem and they have rounder cotyledons and they're about half of the height. And that height difference continues throughout. So here in this picture on the left is the indeterminate, probably brandywine, and on the right is a dwarf. And that plant is half of the height as the one on the, on the far left, even though these were all planted at the same time. And this is another um, depiction of that. Colors, th this is just an example of how color dominance works. So we crossed a Cherokee chocolate on the left and Mr. Snow on the right. We crossed a red with a white and the hybrid is a boring old orange because Cherokee chocolate has red flesh and Cherokee chocolate has yellow skin. So all of the characteristics of Mr. Snow, white flesh, clear skin were completely dominated by the dominant genes from Cherokee chocolate. And the hybrid was just a plain old normal red tomato that looks like you could find at the grocery store. That's success. Here is Everglades. And I'm so pleased that Melissa gave me this. I love the, I love the flavor. It, was, it really is just like a pink version of Mexico Midget. Uh, I actually sent it to Mike at Victory Seeds and he now sells it in his catalog. And I think Melissa, you sold it to, you must've sent it to Ira. 
because I think it's also being sold by Southern Exposure Seed Exchange. Yeah. This is Tanunda Red. This is your dwarf that produces a nice eight ounce scarlet slicing tomato. And this is what the hybrid fruit looked like. Um, I grew these in October because I wanted to get some F1 seed saved right away. I actually picked these when they were full size and ripened them indoors and they turned scarlet red. So this is pink Everglades times red Tanunda red gave the red Evie hybrid. And even though, and again, here you can see you cross the pea-sized Everglades with the eight ounce Tanunda and you get like a half ounce, one ounce cherry tomato. Now this may be of interest for working food to try out as a, one of the varieties to have people grow out. There, we, when we did Evi, we also did Zelly, and Zelly was Evergla Everglades crossed with Rosella Crimson, which is an eight ounce pink dwarf. So I didn't send this one um, to Melissa because the color interest isn't there. All of the dwarfs, all, everything out of this will be pink. Whereas with the Evi cross, you get a chance of finding some reds and some pinks. But this is now Johnson's Cherry. It's been released by Victory Seeds. And this would be a really interesting one to see how it would handle the conditions in uh, Florida. And if you would like to play with the Zelly cross as well, uh, if you don't find enough interesting things from uh, Evi, I can also send you seeds from Zelly because I've got lots saved. How did we track all of this stuff? Um, we use this website, Tomatoville, and we created, every time we created something, we did a cross, we called it a family, and all of the work would fall under that family. So Evie is a family. And these are all of our other families, Bashful, Beastly, Beauty, Brawny, Candy, Cheeky. We have a hundred families, so we've been really busy. This was a great website format-wise to track our progress, but it's tenuous. And now the person who owns this is thinking he doesn't want to run Tomatoville anymore. If he takes it down, all of our dwarf project data will be lost. It, it's a P2P type format. And so these pages really don't exist outside of the server that he has them on. So that's, that's one of the risks. The other thing that a project like this, it's important to collect data. And this is my Excel spreadsheet that's just monstrous. And I've got the family name, the named variety, who's working on it, what the seed source file is, and a description. Victory Seeds has dedicated a, a whole page to the Dwarf Tomato Project, and they're all in alphabetical order. So all 145 of our releases are sitting there in the Victory Catalog, including Dwarf Johnson's Cherry, if you want to read about it. And if you do get something you love out of Evie uh, and want it released, and let's say you were interested in Victory, um, you just work it out to the F6, F7 generation, test it to see if it's stable. Mike would love to get a sample. You could tell its story, put the names of everybody who worked on it and would end up, end up here. And what's really cool is if you click any one of these varieties, every single person who's even laid a hand on the seeds, even if they haven't contributed to the final result, gets their name. So someday you can show your friends I have my name in a seed catalog next to a variety. And it's uh, that's kind of all the pay there is in the Dwarf Tomato Project. All we can really promise people is uh, you get to participate in a group of people working for something useful and you get your name in a seed catalog someday. But it's not so bad. So just to encapsulate some of the challenges of a project like this, and uh, Melissa may, may be grappling with some of these herself. I know we have. Consistent resources is always a challenge. So when I mentioned a thousand people have been involved with this, most 90% of the successes have come from a core of about 80 people. Now it's great. The other 920 dabbled in it, asked for seeds, played with it, sent us some results, but maybe they decided it wasn't for them. Maybe they moved, maybe they weren't interested in gardening anymore or all the data stuff was just too much for them. That's fine. Adequate and consistent data collection is really hard. At the beginning of a garden season, this stuff all sounds great, but when it, it's hot out and you're sweating and you're picking tomatoes and saving seeds and, oh, do I really wanna weigh these tomatoes or measure them or just, or take pictures of them or decide? And so at the end of my season, I think I have 10 times more of the data than I actually have. Consistent return of seed samples. I've sent tons of seed out. 
only a fraction of have come back, but that fraction has led to our 145 releases. Here's one of the main problems in doing a project like we're doing. Some of us have gardens where, where people grew one plant, five plants, 10 plants, some 100 plants, but we've left a lot of great stuff on the cutting room floor because if we were to do this right, every family we would be growing out hundreds of plants to see everything possible is there. We're only, the way we do it, we're trying to get lucky and find great stuff on very small populations. And um, here's the real kicker. We've got all of these varieties out there, but if I get an email saying, which one of these will grow well in Maine or Oregon or Arizona or Florida or Texas, I can't answer it because they've not been out there long enough and we haven't had data returned to us to know which one of them's pe which one of them people love the best or which one of them really people aren't too crazy about the flavor or they they drop dead in Florida or they don't ripen in Vancouver so it's a work in progress seedlink has been a real helpful platform to start collecting some of this data the tomato course I'm doing with Joe Lample, we've got a spreadsheet in there and we're trying to collect some of the data there. Um, but this is hard. This is one of the hard parts of a breeding project. It, it's not getting a variety finished. It's then finding out how that variety does. Now for you, it may be a little simpler because I think to me, you're doing some location specific breeding to find things that grow really, really well in your area. So you have some of this already built in. But then what will be interesting is to let these leave the nest. And if you've got friends in Seattle or Michigan or Vermont, see what they think of it. So I think, um, and if people, uh, Melissa will pass this along if you wanna take a picture of the screen. It's my, my, the Dwarf Tomato Project to my website, Petrina's website, my email and Petrina's email if anybody has any questions. But that's kind of my whirlwind tour of the project, customized towards your own needs. And uh, you know that may have stimulated lots of questions of which I'm happy to hang around and answer as long as you need me. Thanks, Craig, that was awesome. Yeah, was that uh, kind of, is that okay? Meet the yeah, needs for you? No, that's great. Um, it's so fascinating. I mean, I've known about your project for a long time. That's how we met, but just to yeah. see it all laid out and then the real, you know, I guess the reality of how these sorts of public plant breeding things actually work out, you know, <laughs> which is you know helpful. The, well, think about it in terms of the seed savers exchange that millions of people garden in, and seed savers has never had more than about 1200 listed members. So gardening, I mean, everybody loves to garden, but the, the desire to really get into kind of the R and D side of things does not bite all that many people. So when you do find people that are interested in this sort of things, you've got to grab them. Mm -hmm. you, you can have a room of a million people, one or two people are going to say, wow, I want to do that. And the challenge to our project is trying to find those nerdy, geeky, sciencey types that just have fun making the garden their own little personal sandbox but they also have an empathetic side to their personality as they want to do good for others. So this project kind of select, and I mean, your organization, you guys know all about this, trying to do good work to serve others. That's what a breeding project like this actually is. So mm -hmm. it's kind of fun. Um, so for those of you that are growing Evies for the first time, Marion and uh, Emily and supportive boyfriend, um, mm -hmm. do you have any questions yeah. about from either myself and Sarah or... Craig on what to expect or if you have any sort of ulterior motives in this other than growing really cool varieties? Um, well, I did notice when I was planting them out how thick the stem was. I mean, immediately I noticed that because I had just grown a ton of, of tomatoes for our Master Gardener volunteer plant sale and none of the stems looked like that. And I was like, <laughs> what am I doing wrong? My stems didn't look. So now I'm <laughs> I'm relieved to know that it's the variety. Um, I'm very excited to participate. Um, I hope that um, I'm always concerned about, you know, my gardening technique. Is it, am I not a good enough gardener? So um, there, there is no pressure in this project, which is one of the beauty of right. it. There's no, there's no failure in gardening. Anything that happens in your garden is information that we right. will all find useful. And what you mentioned about that thick stem, 
is really the answer. The, a lot of times people will say, so tell me about dwarfs. Are they determinate or indeterminate? And I say, no, they're dwarfs. They are a, a third type of tomato that has just been very, very obscure all through the years because there's been so few of them in existence. And yet the very first dwarf appeared in the 1850s. It's just no one really knew what to do with it or made anything of it. And they didn't fit people's perceptions of what a tomato plant should be. So they just lay there ignored for us to come along and make a project out of them. So, um, but you know, it's interesting, Melissa, Tom Wagner worked on dwarfs for quite a while. He just was so, he, it was, he needed to make money off his breeding project. So he just never let any of it out. He just mm -hmm. created them and bred them and never told anybody about them and never let anybody grow them. Hmm. So it's a perfect example of if all one thinks about is money, then the bus will just pass them by. They will just, their, all their good work will go unnoticed because they've hoarded the good work. Yeah. So it's That's kind of sad. sad in a way. Yeah, very um, sad. To go back to something Marion said yeah. and then tack on to what you said. Yeah. I think what's interesting for me in releasing these to so many other folks to try is, you know, we have our way of growing stuff. Mm. And so, but that's really different than how other people do it. So Marion's mm. techniques versus someone that's in a small pot or a, mm. you know, a box bed or whatever they do, yeah. like, it's just going to be really interesting to see how they do differently. And, you know, we didn't really focus on this last year, but we had a few extra leftovers and Sarah and I plunked them in a pot and we kind yeah. of, we didn't totally ignore them, but they didn't get the best attention. And of course they, the same thing grew extremely differently than the ones next door yeah. in the ground getting, all the things and so we're more intentionally doing that this year we have yeah. them in the ground and then some in the pots just to see because like you said earlier there's absolutely a demand for this our short little Gosh. observation from this season has been yeah. all the gardeners wanted number 39 because that was <laughs> going to be the more compact one so yeah. um and let me let me talk a bit about goals because we haven't covered this yet so let's say you're growing these the types of data that will be really interesting to collect will be um, plant health throughout the season. So how well does it grow? How well does it fruit? But really, how, what is the plant health like? Does it get annihilated with diseases early on uh, compared to other tomatoes in your garden? Does it seem to withstand diseases? And if you can get to the point of understanding you know, when a tomato gets septoria leaf spot versus early blight, versus something like a, a fusarium or wilt or verticillium wilt or whatever, you know, you have gray molds. There's, you will know your diseases better than I down in Florida. But if you can get kind of specific in your observations, is it healthier than the other varieties? If it gets disease, which, which diseases are they? I think that's, that bores a lot of gardeners, but I think for your particular, every project that will be a particularly interesting parameter to know. Mm -hmm. I think um, relative yield will be interesting. So I love this tomato, it tastes great, but I picked three tomatoes off it. So why would I wanna grow it again versus, wow, this thing was like a, a tomato machine. Mm -hmm. Flavor is really important. Um, fruit color is, is probably interesting to note in fruit size, but you almost have to flip it upside down for you guys, where most people in our dwarf project, it's always what color is it? What size is it? How does it taste? With you, I think it should be how well does it grow? Um, what is the yield like? And then you get into things like, and then maybe the next thing will be how good does it taste? Mm -hmm. so, so think in terms of, a gar of gardeners as your target things that you want to tell them that will make them want to grow this plant. It will really resist disease as well. It will be this cool little red or pink cherry tomato. It will taste great. It will yield good. Um, so all of you who are gr test growing, this is for all of you who will probably watch this after the fact since we're recording it. Think about what's really important for you to recognize about these plants. Um, this is your chance to be a citizen scientist. Think about that and contribute something really mm -hmm. cool. So 
I can't yeah. wait to find out what you guys find out. <laughs> and I think because everyone has different preferences, like mine mm. don't necessarily equal Marion's, which yes. don't necessarily equal Emily's, especially when it comes to flavor. Um, oh my gosh. Which we've, I'm sure you've experienced this too. You know, we'll be out in the field tasting with Tim and, you know, he's like practically vomiting over the flavor of one. Well, we're like, this is the best tomato we've ever tasted. Uh, it's a little dramatic, but, you know, he's spitting it out and making faces. And, um, yeah. you know, yeah. so everyone can be like their own, you know, carrying these seeds because they're also open source for us. I have no yeah. interest in, you know, trying to own these or doing anything crazy like that. So if someone decides this one particular plant just blew their yeah. minds and they loved the flavor and they liked the shape and whatever else, you know, that's something that they can save and just keep yeah. going forward as their Evy project. You, you know, you say that you want it open source, but at some point, if let's say that you're, you get some really good varieties. I could see a future fundraiser for your organization where you could slap some names on these and sell some tomatoes that are going to really do well for people once you've given them names mm -hmm. and they're stable. So I think I, I never like to look at this type of a project for personal income, but I would love to look at it as possible how did we choose the seed companies at first? I wanted to find small seed companies that were struggling to find a name that could compete with the big ones. So give them something to feature so that it could help them compete. So Baker Creek is big enough. I never contacted them, but Victory Seeds is kind of tiny and Heritage Seeds is kind of tiny. Helps level the playing field if you give. And now mm -hmm. Adaptive Seeds in Oregon have, have started growing some of these. I think that's yeah. great. But for fundraising, for... Um, getting them into the community. And uh, I, I think there's lots of flexibility for once you succeed with a set of these and they have nice cool names, you know, um, Gainesville giant or whatever, <laughs> whatever you want to call them. Mm -hmm. um, but mo I mean, all I, for all of you who are here, it, the most thing is have, have fun with this project and learn as much as you can about just basic elemental guard tomato genetics or, or gardening methodology. It's like, um, I've been gardening 40 years and every year I make mistakes and every year I learn something new. And that's why I'm gonna be gardening in 10 more years or 20 more years or as long as I can do it. But um, I'm just so thrilled that you guys are, those of you who are here, I'm glad you're here listening and everybody who's working on it that's not here, but will hear this. Bravo, man, I'm very excited. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, so are we. Sarah and I are really excited this year. Um, just for Marion and Emily on the line, just our, our project at the Grow Hub Gardens this year is a little bit different than you all's. So we actually took three of the lines that seemed the most similar to number 39, mm -hmm. including number 39. So 39 is the more dwarfy one, which we, I think, accurately predicted would be more popular with home gardeners. And we took number 40 and 41 that were also very similar. So we're gonna, this was at Craig and Tim's suggestion of what we should do next um, and kind of look at those really closely this year and see how close they are. And we're gonna have a lot of questions as this goes on too. Um, if they look pretty similar, I think what, what I remember you saying, Craig, is that we just kind of like group the seeds and we've got our new variety, but if they still seem to have quite a few differences and I think we still have a few different lines and more selection yep. to work on. So with a breeding project like this, you've got your morphological characteristics that are really easy. So growth habit is really easy. Um, fruit color, fruit shape, really easy. The tricky ones, you can't see flavor and um, you can't see what the resistance to diseases are going to be like by looking at a plant. So right. I would say nail down the easy ones. We, you know, we have a flavor that we like. Well, we have a color that we like that's consistent in a plant habit, leaf shape, blah, blah, blah. And then maybe where you do the um, testing from that point on is really paying attention to ability to, with, to withstand disease and um, flavor uniformity. And that's when you really, that's the hardest thing to nail down with a project like this because you we, can't see it. Yeah. So a couple other observations we noticed from last year as well is that they were definitely later to produce. So when mm -hmm. almost all the other regular tomatoes were finishing, mm. it seemed like these ones were just starting. But mm. this year they're flowering already mm. and they're young. Again, like you said earlier, every year is different. You can't 
predict the weather and how things are going to grow. But that was one observation. And in our notes, when we were looking back at it, it was like mid-July. We were like, it's too hot. We're going to terminate the project. Um, Mm -hmm. So I want to see how long they go um, and if they are that late. And then the other that I guess is related to the growth habit. I don't know if you've seen this, but we noticed a few of them have this very convenient harvesting habit where all the tomatoes were up high like oh cool oh yeah yeah over yeah the foliage or just yes. underneath it and so you weren't like digging because some of the dwarfs were so dense that you're like you know looking in there for tomatoes and it just didn't it's not very effective and others it was like shoot like yeah. there they are just that is thick. yeah that i think is a strong influence from uh Tenunda red mm. which tends to pop up blossom clusters have you seen uh of, are you for the promising ones, are you seeing pink and red or just one particular color? So uh, Scott, do you recall? I feel like they were mostly like pinks, like they weren't like the deep reds. Yes. I was gonna say mostly pink. Okay. Yeah. There yeah. were some that were red, but mostly pink. And the shapes think... were kind of all over the place too, actually. Oh, really? like some were small and some were like almost Everglaze size, even on the same plant sometimes. And then right. like a lo- like a regular size cherry. And there was yeah. a few that had that like heirloomy ribbed shape, but they were still just like that big. I call them the mini bee steaks that you, wh- whenever, you when, whenever you whenever um, you cross an Everglaze or Mexico midget sized tomato with a larger um, dwarf, you get some of those that throw mini bee-, bee steaks. Some people love them, some don't. Sometimes the interior is really corky and firm. Sometimes it's delicious. Mm-hmm. So, but it's pretty unique. Make like a cool little hors d'oeuvre yeah. tomato. You could kind of cut them in half and stuff them or something. One of the chefs who saw it before she even tasted it was like, I want those. Grow me more yeah. of those. Like, that's so pretty on a plate. Like, how cute is that? Yeah. Like a tiny little tomato that looks like a big heirloom. Well, and you know, I'm, I'm thinking Everglades, pink tomato. We need to cross it with a yellow potato leaf. We need to cross mm. it with, uh, we need to cross it with Lucky Cross, a bicolored, delicious potato leaf. Because then, you know, if you guys, if people have fun with this down there and you want to increase the color range, then all we need to do is cross Everglades with um, Cherokee chocolate, Green Giant. I mean, and then you start getting your dwarf disease resistant varieties with yellow and red swirls and stripes. And so I I have a feeling, Melissa, we're at step A or B rather than W or Z in in this little collaboration we have going. Mm -hmm. Sarah's smiling. You must like this, Sarah. (laughs) I'm excited. I'm like, yes. (laughs) So yeah, (laughs) so I'm I'm gonna make a note. Uh, It may not be this year, although it could be this year i'm going to make a note because everglades is so fast i can plant seeds and it's it's up and flowering no time grow everglades and do some crosses so yes i'm going to do that the weirder and more artistic the better i'm a sucker for beauty even if the flavor is just going to be like adequate but it's gorgeous so maybe we need to do like uh so blues bling is a variegated cherokee purple so we could work in variegation we can work in anthocyanin. We, I could work in yellow foliage. Okay, we'll have we'll have a separate session someday and look at the possibilities and yes. uh, think about what we can do. This is the stuff that makes me want to garden. The fun. Mm-hmm. <laughs> totally. And, I always you know, have to and have I'm a hit- project each year. You know, it can't just be like let's yeah. just grow the same things for seed. There always has to be like a fun thing that we're doing that keeps our brains functioning yes. and uh, curious. And, you know, I'm pretty available now. I'm a retired guy. So at different points of the year, you want to click and do one of these. If you want to just take take a camera into the garden and show me around and I'll have mine. Um, don't you dare ever send me another cent. I, I do this as a labor of love and because of our friendship and the belief in what you guys are doing. So uh, just consider me a resource and a friend and whatever I can do for you guys. Always. Awesome. And do come to and do come to visit Hendersonville sometime, man. Yeah. <laughs> I would love to. Sarah and I really need to do another. Well, another. I've done a few Southeast road trips, but Sarah needs to come on one with me and go visit all the cool things that are happening yeah. in the Carolinas. So I think you know it's this is great because things have come to mind. But I think I've covered everything I want to say. So just if uh, if Emily or uh, Marion or Sarah or you, Melissa, if you guys have any other questions, otherwise we'll, uh, you know, call it a wrap when we're done and do another one soon. Yeah. 
I have a quick question and it, it might be a silly mm. one, but um, you know, if I were to take, like you mentioned crossing the green mm. giant with the Everglades, mm. I've got a green giant in my garden now. Can we cross it with an Evi? Would that do anything or that wouldn't mm. give us enough? No, no, no. So you could cross green giant with one of the Evi dwarfs and uh, it would be so cool. Yeah. I mean, so green times pink, you could get white, yellow. If, if you pick a, um, a scarlet Evi, that makes it even more interesting because then you've got um, yellow skin and clear skin. You've got red flesh and green flesh and hidden behind green flesh is white flesh. So yeah, you could get a lot of, so do a, do a green giant times a scarlet fruited Evi dwarf and you will just have a blast with that. Ooh. Hey Mel, I'm going to claim one of the plants. <laughs> yep, I was just going to. And the other, and the other thing it. is, Green Giant is like one of the five best tomatoes I've ever eaten. So you'll be injecting that with like super flavor genes. Mm. Yeah, Craig, I mean, uh, Tim sent me his list, and I had your book, and I was mm. reading the Green Giant, and I was like, okay, this is definitely one. <laughs> Good. Oh, you'll go crazy over it. You know, I get that from a guy in Germany about uh, let's see, it was 2007, and. Uh, I looked at it and like, ah, it looks like a normal green tomato. And it, it won tomato palooza's tasting. My friend Lee brought it to Cincinnati and it won their tomato tasting. It's mm. phenomenal. It is absolutely phenomenal. Yeah. And cool. uh, Sarah, get my email. If you have any other ideas, just shoot me notes back and forth. And, uh, you know, let me, I can kind of be a breeding advisor and give you ideas based on what you have, but do. Yeah. Make yes. some crosses. Thank you very much. Anything else here, my friend? I don't have anything, Marion or Emily, if you don't either. Nope, no, nope, nothing. Just very awesome. excited to grow some tomatoes. Cool. Awesome. We're excited to see how they how they work out for y'all. All right. Santa Claus here is going to check off and uh, All right. <laughs> go water my straw bales. All right. Thanks um, a whole bunch, Craig. And everyone nice else meeting for you. Showing nice up. meeting you. Yep. Nice meeting you, Sarah, Emily, Marion. Nice seeing you again. Melissa, Bye. we'll reconvene in the Talk future. Okay. <laughs> bye. Bye. All right. Bye.